very good morning uh, and warm welcome to uh, this session uh, from those participating in india and those participating in europe and africa good afternoon and those from the us very good evening today is a very auspicious day uh, in india and this day is a celebration of evil you uh, know celebration of you know win, winning over the evil by the goodness and it is represented by a uh, uh, goddess winning over a uh, what, what what we call a asura uh, which is the sign of evil so i think that that is something very good uh, to make a beginning as we are discussing about women land rights on this durga stami day what do uh, durga stami day what we call it the sahara uh, durga puja or the sai in the uh, vijaya dasmi in different part of india uh, so happy to have uh, this session uh, coming up in a day so auspicious and uh, as all of you know uh, uh, we always talk about a gender equal world but mostly as a normative concern as a, or as a social reform but i think this is also you know uh, can be an economic imperative and a business strategy so i think that is the very context you know aviskar groups uh, which you know talk about uh, impact investment you know uh, is is committed to bringing an impact across this you uh, know uh, social reform dom domain including gender and equity and uh, if you have read the impact report of 2020 of uh, the group which was released in march you know april 21 you know it talked about how it you uh, know uh, and it was uh, that that particular report was dedicated to 55 million uh, women leaders who have been part of this impact journey of this group and uh, the binit rai the chairman of the group uh, he feels that the idea of impact cannot be justified without 50% of humanity uh, being on equal footing at all level with men i think in that context you know the group's mandate uh, is also quite aligning with the session as we are trying to do and aviskar seeks to achieve a gender balance by 2030 but as you know along with employment you know access to and access to and control over uh, uh, land and ownership of land is you know one of the another cornerstone which is critical for economic freedom and economic equality and economic empowerment and uh, uh, particularly in a country like india where more than 75% of wealth is captured in land and housing properties and uh, uh, aaj aaj uh, you know sankalp uh, aaj platform uh, aaj all of you know has been trying to center stage on mainstream gender uh, over last few years and uh, particularly as a core ajula je no cross cutting strategy in its attempt to move the needle forward towards sdg and uh, uh, very uh, encouraging to note that sankal particularly this year has underlined land right as a theme uh, where you know the discussions will be uh, around land right and we at center for nrg center for land governance which are now being part of this you know as a new addition to intelicap cap uh, as part of the avisca group we are so happy and excited to see that we are together you uh, know having this women land right day i, I can call it today uh, on the durga stami day where two sessions were devoting to women land rights this agenda uh, i i am i am very happy to join this journey uh, toward the gender equal world uh, with all of you and present before uh, uh, all of you uh, who are all i think equally concerned and committed uh to audience you know already almost 30 of them have joined and more are joining uh, uh, uh to our discuss uh, this particular great panel who not only talk about women land rights they also act about women land rights they advance women land rights and many of them are also funding women land rights you know uh, as philanthropists as investors so this is a, a panel who will be talking something which they have been working on and uh, to begin with uh, it is my honor to present the only man in the panel nevertheless uh, is not the only man i think he is the man behind women land right at a global stage always very humble to you know uh, denounce that but i would you know uh, if i may, may dare uh, can i call you the, you are the women land right man in the global platform so nowadays we call water man we call forest man i think a uh, team has been a man, man for women land right a champion causing the you know, uh, working towards women uh, land rights starting from india and all across the globe as the co-founder of landesa and then you know ceo of uh, chandler's foundation thanks team for being with us at this late hours of night you are in seattle 
and no i think you are you are 12 or 30 uh, minutes behind and i think for you it is evening time uh, and thanks for joining that i uh, may also present uh, to you shikha srivastav uh, shikha works with tata trust and all of you know uh, the group who takes over uh, again air india now but shikha works as philanthropy part and has been leading uh, their you know uh, urban uh, urban uh, habitat and migration program and shikha is a passionate you know gender uh, uh, activist researcher and she has been trying to integrate you know as part of her development journey she has worked across uh, different development domains health sanitation uh, housing uh, you know across uh, national and global ngos and the tata trust he recently led an initiative with orissa slum dwellers project where he should try to mainstream on uh, women land right and she will be talking more about that i am also happy to welcome a very new entrant to this field but uh, personally she is very passionate and i have been interacting with over last more than one year and i see her enthusiasm uh, she is shivani gupta she leads humanity foundation in india and she comes with a background of technology corporate experience nevertheless no her passion and her knowledge of development sector is phenomenal sometimes i bow my head for her because of no his not knowledge about the people working in the sector now and humanity uh, with her leadership is taking forward this initiative of promoting women land rights starting this year and last but not the least we have the moderator here uh, no shreya dev i think most of us working in either in impact investment sector or in land right must be knowing her she has been, uh, she was leading uh, and i think almost founding india's you know when india's uh, property right uh, you know vertical and uh, all of us working in sector uh, know how passionate and how enthusiastic she is uh in promoting you know the causes uh, be it with the you uh, know ngos be with uh, startups be with the academia so i have close i have an opportunity uh, for good fortune of working with us closely around the property rights just consortium consortium that she started uh with uh, different research institutes and i have seen how that is impacting now welcome uh, shreya uh with this i think my job ends and i hand over shreya uh, the uh, mantle to take it forward with this or our three leaders i think who among themselves have more than 100 years of experience in promoting women land right i and i dare to say a million women's life in the world thank you sir please take it over and sorry yeah. sorry sir uh, sorry just a minute i am very sorry before i you know hand it step for the audience those who have joined we'll be having a uh, you know lounge uh, discussions where uh, you can have very small group discussion the small group interaction with team and shreya and shivani and shikha so please feel to join after 11:30 the link will be shared with you and you know feel free to join and that will be kind of more close interactions uh, lounge interaction where you can ask your questions and we'll be discussing more about how impact investment can enhance human land right uh, shreya uh, please thank you Thanks a lot, Pranav, and uh, really excited that Sankalp has, uh, you know, have created this uh, platform for women's land, lands right to actually take the main stage, and super excited to have this wonderful panel with us. Um, Tim co-founded Landessa, which has been like the pioneering NGO in the world to even start defining what land rights means for women. Um, Shikha, who has led. i would say arguably the largest urban land titling program in asia and maybe even the world and uh, shivani you're bringing so much great energy vitality and innovation into this space we're very excited to have you um before we start our discussion and conversation today i think there's a short video um george may i request you to please play it Economic survey of 2018 says, as men migrate to urban areas and to non-farm sectors in response to both the distress in agriculture and better job opportunities elsewhere, women's responsibility both as workers and as farm managers is being growing, leading to an increased feminization of agriculture. But when it comes to land rights, the ownership remains with the men in the family.
The understanding among women about the current inheritance law and the claim processes is still very rudimentary. Rambati from Bundelkhand is one of the many women who desire to have a land in their name. और खेती बाड़ी भी हम करते हैं घर में घर को भी काम करते हैं लेकिन हमें पुरुष को अधिकार मिलता है जमीन जायदाद का लेकिन महिला के काज कोई अधिकार नहीं मिलता है कर कर के मर जाती हैं अभी तक कोई लाभ नहीं दिया है किसी सरकार ने और ना किसी आदमी ने While it is difficult and time taking to help women get their land rights government civil society organization and the women themselves are working towards this A number of laws in India allow for gender equitable land ownership and access in the country the most famous one being the Hindu Succession Act amendment 2005 A report by Landesa released in 2013 states the gaps and loopholes in the implementation of Hindu Succession Amendment Act 2005 which still holds true. One of the gaps being patriarchy and lack of awareness within the government. The report also stated that the decision making controls on use of the land remains firmly in the grip of men despite the ownership being with the women. While the road to getting land rights for women is a difficult one, women land rights can have many positive impacts on her life. का कर कहे अपन जब हम आ रहा तो कहे का कहो कर देरा इबे कहे का कर बे आप करी था खाई था सूला देवी वाज बीइंग प्रेशर्ड बाय हर फैमिली टू लेट हर हस्बैंड मारी अनदर वुमन शी न्यू दैट शी बी बैनिश्ड वंस हर हस्बैंड ब्रॉट अनदर वाइफ शी स्ट्रांगली डिमांडेड द लैंड इन हर नेम फॉर हर ओन सोशल सिक्योरिटी हम अपने को खुद आजाद समझते हैं हम किसी के पाबंदी में नहीं हमें जहां जाना है हम खुद चले जाएंगे Wow, that was an amazing uh, video. Such a great way to start this conversation. Thank you so much, Womanity Foundation, for sharing that video. Um, in fact, I'll start with you, Shivani, as the the new entrant into this space. Um, let me start by asking you, right? What made uh, Womanity Foundation decide to work on women's land rights? Because globally, very and even in India, very very few funders work in this space. Um, thank you, Shreya, and good morning to everybody. And it's an absolute honor to be on this panel. And uh, I think the uh, Shreya, to answer your question, I think the film kind of lays down our journey uh, to understanding land rights and uh, uh, what kind of pulled us really to this sector or this cause is uh, the multifold impact that uh, having access to land can have on women. Uh, and it goes beyond the economics of it, right? I I think everybody, most funders look at it like, okay, you will get access to agriculture and you can sell it and all that stuff. But if you kind of peel the layers a bit more, um, it is probably one of the most equitable solution and a most sustainable solution to gender equality because it has impact on how she feeds herself, how she feeds her kids. Uh, domestic violence, um, not only the fact that domestic violence may go down, but really how she reacts to domestic violence, right? Because she has that agency to say, okay, I'm not going to take this shit from anybody, but I'm, like I have something to kind of fall back on. So it's more than asset and income generation. And at the underlying level, I think it's probably the last bastion of patriarchy in our thinking. And we come with a deep gender focus, uh, you know, the name of the foundation says everything. We've been working with gender for the last 15 years. And we have a history of uh, working in uh, underfunded resource uh, areas, in underfunded causes across the world. So I think it kind of um, fit in quite well uh, from the ethos of being a bit more entrepreneurial, um, a bit more uh, almost like, uh, I, you know, Landesa and a lot of organizations have done a lot of work 
in getting policy changes, legal changes done. Uh, but but the gaps were in implementation, and and that's where we have focused because it kind of plays into our um, core competency, for lack of a better word. And we can talk about it more later. And when we did a, a like a scan, and we spent Shreya, you know, we've spent one and a half years just trying to peel the layers because it is complex. Like there's no getting away from that. And we realized that uh, actually the law and the policy is fairly gender equitable, uh, right? If you look at a World Bank report into which came earlier this year, it paints it. Uh, places the gender equality quotient at 80% in terms of asset ownership to India, which is which is still 20% away, but I think 80% is not bad, where things are, uh, you know, it's very difficult to get stuff done. But what we need to understand is that it's time taking, you need a lot of patience. Uh, there are not enough defined models in the system, which can be taken from one place to another. So you are, need to give them that you need to give your on-ground partners that flexibility of learning, failing, uh, and not to say that you collapse because these are great organizations coming from women rights perspective or land rights perspective, but uh, it's about giving that uh, leeway to experiment, innovate kind of thing. Uh, I think those are the kind of uh, you know issues we unpeeled as we uh, kind of uh, learn this thing and and the interesting thing on the funder piece is that for some reason it's perceived as a controversial issue to be working with and what we realize is it's not controversial if you pick your uh, areas correctly so most of the current funders actually work on the periphery of this either through agriculture or through livelihoods and, uh, and our aim is to really get them together and say okay can you add another layer so continue to do agriculture but can you add ownership and access as an inherent piece to it? So that's really the perspective. And we are totally excited about it. Um, as you know, we've had enough conversations about it. So I think that's really um, what kind of drew us to it is the impact on the women and the fact that we love to pick causes which would probably need, which would uh, need a spotlight on the World Forum. Uh, and taking it to uh, you know bigger foundations from a funding perspective. So I don't know if I answered your question. But, yeah. You did, Shivani. That's so good to hear. I think you know a couple of points that resonate. Right, this is one lever which has multifold impact. Be it agriculture, livelihood, you know, aid, women's agency, so many things. Um, so leaving it out of the system. Uh, is a little baffling, but at the same time, I think as a funder, you need to play the long game. This is not something that changes in a year or six months. You need to have patience. Absolutely agree. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, request Shikha. Um, Shikha, you've got a, a different, um, you know, experience of working on urban, and actually, urban perhaps could be even more controversial than, uh, you know, rural women. But maybe we'll start off, Shikha, by, you know, if you can tell us based on your experience in Odessa. Uh, where close to your program led to the mapping of close to two lakh households. The objective was to give all these slum households across the state of Orissa land titles. Um, can you reflect on your experience and tell us what was the status of women's land rights and what was the impact of the program on women's land rights? Thanks, Shreya. Good morning, everyone, and privileged um, to be part of this esteemed panel and of this discussion. Um, my apologies, firstly, I can't keep my video on. I've been constantly told that my internet connection is unstable. So um, uh, please bear with me and I hope I can talk through this session and learn and interact. So um, firstly, I represent Tata Trust and uh, that's one of India's uh, largest philanthropic organization. Uh, the trust engagement in urban space has been focused on, uh, you know, on the informal settlements, on the most marginalized access to basic services. And uh, Shreya, like you rightly mentioned, urban uh, issues uh, are very, very complex, in some cases controversial. Uh, but then I would definitely say much, much more complex than the issues that we, we face in the rural areas. Um, I will not dwell on that right now, but of course the complexity uh, makes it very, very challenging. And our work in, in land rights actually began 
with the work that we wanted to do for slum communities. Um, and I'm talking now specifically in the context of Odessa. We work in other states in the country also, but um, you know, Odessa has been one of our very successful programs, especially when it comes to land rights. And our work uh, in Odessa on land rights actually began with uh, you know, our, our, uh, our objective to do something on basic services. And that's when we, when we started interacting with some slum communities and especially the women, we realized sanitation, and this has been an experience all over the country, sanitation, um, waste management, water, these are prime concerns for women in slum settlements, mainly because they're denied access to these. It's a daily struggle to get, uh, you know, to get water, to get access to a safe toilet for themselves, for their daughters. Um, and uh, we realized that one of the major reasons why families, despite, you know, a government program, uh, several government programs targeting sanitation, why there was such low uptake, especially in the informal settlements, was communities were not willing to make those, you know, investments in basic services till they were assured of a safety of tenure, the freedom from eviction, the fear of ev eviction. Um, and we were fortunate that the Orissa government, you know, it kind of, worked at very good timing. The Orissa government at that time brought out a very pioneer, pioneering legislation called the Land Rights to Slum Dwellers at a Law in 2017. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the law. I will not get into the details, uh, but the law was very pioneering mainly because it said no, no, uh, you know, it said in situ rights. And like Shreya mentioned, um, it, the, the scale was vast. It was looking at 109 urban local bodies across the state. And, uh, so that uh, the law, and especially if I have to talk about the law in the context of land rights, um, I would say that there were, while the law itself, I would say, uh, was, uh, you know, um, was not, and even when, our, when we designed our interventions, it was not very strongly gender focused, but the law itself had certain provisions um, um, that made it very strongly pro-gender. One is that it talked, I think, and this is the first time that it's happened in India, um, and especially in the urban space, is that it talked about joint titling. It said both the spouses um, would have, uh, you know, would be um, would be mentioned in the land rights, would have uh, the certificate of land rights, would the patta, as it was called, would have the names of both the husband and wife. And in case of, you know, a single uh, person headed household, it would be of the person head, that single person heading the household. Um, so those, these are very, very uh, strong uh, provisions, especially in the urban context, because we must realize these are informal settlements. These are people who, um, are basically not belonging to these urban areas. They're migrants moving in. For them, it gives them a kind of a security. It gives them um, that empowerment, especially for the women. So, and the second thing that it said was it it allowed for that land for this prop land right is was both heritable and mortgageable. It was an uh, it was an address proof, which is um, very very uh, you know which is a very strong uh, requirement for women here. Um, the other thing that I would want to talk about, especially in the context of the law, was that um, we partnered with the government of Orissa, who brought out this very pioneering legislation in the implementation of the law, because we realized while the spirit of the law would, is very, very laudable, the implementation is what matters. And here we were, you know, we were fortunate to work with, uh, with a wide um, group of partners uh, like the Omidya Network and Shreya uh, and her team were also part of that. We had... Uh, you know, we had other uh, uh, partners who brought in their requisite skills, but the implementation importantly created processes and structures that empowered women. First, it created every slum has a slum dwellers association or SDA. So across the state of Orissa, we have around 1,900 slum dwellers association and more than half of these, uh, the membership of these slum dwellers association has to be of women. And that is something that's being very, very strictly enforced. Slum Dwellers Association, um, more than half of them women who uh, played a very, very critical role in the allocation of land rights. So a transparency, a community ownership uh, led by women that was brought about in the implementation of the law. Um, and the uh, second part is that the SDAs till date continue to play a very strong role in the uh, in the urban governance process, in the whole process of slum upgradation, of redevelopment of the slums, um, and this is being led by women. 
So if you're talking in terms of what is the current status, the law was uh, passed in 2017. We've been working with the government of Orissa. Till date, about 65,000 beneficiaries uh, across um, the state of Orissa have got land rights. That means 65,000 women now have titles to land in urban areas. And we have about 1,900 slum dwellers associations, as I mentioned. What is What has been the impact on the ground? Um, we are... Um, you know, while we've not done any uh, detailed analysis uh, of this, but our field interactions, what they've, uh, you know, what they've demonstrated to us has been, uh, you know, in the interactions we found uh, many women now, a lot of these women in many slums, like uh, in across the country and globally in the developing world, a lot of these women are home-based workers. And there has been a definite, a definite uptake in the livelihood that they've been able to get. Uh, there's been an increase in the sanitation facilities that are coming up. We have women who say that, you know, I was doing tailoring initially. I didn't want to expand my business. But now that I have security of tenure, I'm going to buy more sewing machines. There are women who had earlier told us when we interacted with them, uh, you know, during our field surveys, during the process of the setting up the Slum Dwellers Association about the insecurity they felt because there was no toilets uh, in their communities and how their daughters and, you know, they had to go out at groups late at night to go to the access to the toilet and how, you know, the tenure having land rights has helped them, you know, uh, get san better sanitation facilities, build toilets, demand toilets. So all of that has been a big thing. So it's been... I would say land rights for women and as we've seen on the ground has been a vital form of security for them. It is, it's been economically very good. It's been good for their social status. It's been, uh, you know, today, I just this morning, I was reading in the papers about multidimensional poverty. And this is, I think this is one of the uh, one intervention that can address that multidimensional poverty that we're going to look at. So um, while I will concede that we've not done in-depth analysis, but what we've seen on the ground from our work, what we, you know, getting to see, we had a team working on the ground. We had a fel we had young people as fellows who were working on the ground, interacting with these communities. And the feedback that we're getting is very positive. Women taking leadership role of communities moving forward. Thanks, Shreya. Over to you. And, um, you know, if you want me to address any other issue, please let me know. Sure, sure. Thanks a lot, Shekha. Very, very insightful. And, uh, you know, the impact on sanitation is fantastic, which is a, such a core need. But I think it was a very important point you made around address proof and how a simple address opens up so many you know, access to so many services from a bank account to a government uh, benefit. Um, all basis this. Um, thanks, Shekha, for sharing those insights. Um, Tim, I'm going to move on to you and you, you've, um, not only are you a veteran in this space, you've actually spent many years working in India as well. So would love to get your insights on how do you see the face of women's land rights? And how has it evolved in India and what more needs to be done? Yeah, thank you, Shreya. It's, it is such a privilege and honor to be uh, participating in this Sankal Global Summit in particular in the, on this topic and with this, uh, with you, Shreya, and with uh, Shivani and Shika, I, I'm, I'm just delighted. I mean, you, you asked the question about what, what have I, I have seen in the changes in India on this topic over the last, well, it's been uh, 30 years uh, or so. <laughs> and this, the fact that we are sitting here talking about women's land rights at a global summit about India is at, at least one um, data point that shows me that uh, the topic is at, at least, it, it's at a much different place than it was 30 years ago. Now, there's still a very long, long ways to go. And I, I think that that struggle to continue advancing it will continue for at least another 30 years. And that um, it, it's gonna be long, long term work, but um, maybe just to, to start and to look at the issue from 30,000 feet, which I think sometimes is helpful is just to think about how important land is um, in India, but really in any society, it, it's particularly true in India too. It's just such a critical asset and a, it's a source of wealth, a source of power, 
a source of status, a source of livelihood, a source of habitat. Um, and so who holds and controls land really does matter. And, and research, a growing, growing body of research shows us this, that um, who holds land and rights to land matters. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, women's rights to land are, are much, much weaker than men's. And this is true in India. It's, it's true actually uh, in virtually every country in the world. Um, and that's, that has all kinds of negative spillover effects, not only for women, it certainly does for women, but it has negative spillover effects for, for children, for men, for the broader community and, and ultimately for society. So this, we, we, we've got to, I think, stop thinking about this issue as a woman's issue. It's a societal issue. Um, and anyway, but you asked me the question of how things have changed in India. So I've seen, certainly seen progress. Um, um, I think we've, India's moved from a situation where <clears throat> 25, 30 years ago, there was almost no policy or general awareness about this topic. Um, and now we've moved from at least almost no awareness, no policy discussions to, I would say low awareness and some policy discussions. I, I think Indian, Indian stalwarts like, like Dr. Bina Agarwal, like the late Dr. T. Hawk and, and many others have been really effective at, at raising awareness among policymakers and, and, uh, and, and NGOs and civil society about the importance of providing women's land rights. Um, and as I think both Shivani and, and Chika have mentioned, we've, we've had some forward movement in terms of progressive policies and laws in, in India. Um, there are some encouraging uh, milestones that we can look at. Some were mentioned in, in the very good video that was shown earlier. Uh, Shivani, congrats on that video. It's the first time I've seen it. It was, it was very encouraging. So yeah, Hindu Succession Act Amendment, uh, the, the law in ERISA that has already been talked about, um, policies uh, around joint titling generally of government allocated land of reduced stamp duty for uh, in, in many states for, for, for women. Um, the, so these changes in law and policy, um, there, there's still more change needed there, but there, there's been progress. Now, unfortunately, that is, and I think Shivani mentioned this, this is, um, those policies are necessary, but they're certainly not sufficient. So um, there still is this big gap in, in implementation. So there's not just legal and policy barriers, there's really social cultural barriers. And those are perhaps the most important ones um, that need to be addressed in terms of implementation. Um, so, and, and that those social cultural barriers aren't just about government. I mean, there, there has to be those, there are those barriers within government, government officers, but they're within the general population. You know, the most common way that any private person gets rights to land is through inheritance. And inheritance decisions are ultimately made at the private family level. So we, we can't just be thinking that government's got to change and it's all about government. It, it is, I mean, government, government does need to change, but ultimately it's, it's us and it's, um, it's family decisions. It's about changing the patriarchal mindsets of men in particular, but, but also women, also boys and also girls. So we as parents have, have a role to play in how we raise our boys, how we raise our girls and how they think about, you know, what are the gender norms about having ownership of land? Um, and I think as, as Indian society changes and, and those that patriarchy runs very, very deep in, not just in India, all over the world, but in, in India too. I'm, um, until we start making progress on that, we're, um, and that'll take a long time. 
changing those norms won't come overnight um, and has to be done persistently and constantly with training, with support, with changing mindsets. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature. I so uh, and I I think we'll continue to see progress, but it's going to take work. We can't we can't rest on the laurels of the the little progress we've made so far in India. There's there's just much more to be done. Thanks, Tim. You know, I'm actually cheering from all of you, right? You, there is one common thread that's coming through, which is that, yes, women's land rights is important, but there's so much more to be done. It's not easy. And so therefore, let me try and, you know, kind of address some of these elephants in the room. Um, Shivani, one thing I've heard for the longest time is that land is a very political issue and therefore stay away. So how do you plan to address that? You know, how did you guys think about it? It could be political. Um, so yeah, very, very, very valid uh, perception. And that is what we had when we started our journey. It's political, it is messy, it is complex. Um, and that's why you don't find people doing it. And, um, and like I said, when we peel the layers, right, there is a political angle to it and we cannot get away with it. But I feel there are two other things which are more difficult to work with. Uh, one are the social structures and the other is patriarchy which kind of Tim referred to and and if I think those are much more difficult to deal with when we talk to our on-ground partners and when you talk of social structures you know politics is kind of interwoven very closely to it so for example if you look at the level of marginalization right one is of course the gender piece which we will talk you know which is all which is there in all causes forget land, right? But I think land has a very important lever of class and caste coming in. And we all know that, especially in rural India, the upper caste or the dabang caste that is, it's called, is uh, owns the land and is politically very active. So I think that's something that you need to accept uh, as a current status, but not as a future status. And therefore, how do you work through it, around it, with it, uh, you know, uh, is going to be quite critical in, in turning the tide. I think the other piece is also around the government machinery. It's not the will, but it is the execution piece again. So like Tim rightly mentioned, right, it is about looking at both the demand and the supply side of it. And because I come from corporate sector, for me, everything is a supply chain that you need to kind of fix in life. So you have to look at the demand coming from the women, but not only the women, but also the men in the family, because like Shikha mentioned, right? If you give them access to title, you automatically become a, uh, you know, eligible for so many government schemes, which is a family economics coming into play and not a women economics coming into play. But it is also about patriarchy because I was talking to this lady who is in a very small village in Devas. And she said that when I went to register, uh, a land for one of the women in the community. There were four women who went to a, a patwari or the registrar and he said, oh, why didn't you get your brother? So that's also a mindset. Uh, it's not about knowledge. It's not about awareness. It's about mindset at a very, very deep level. So I think we have to work on the demand piece, but also on the supply piece, be it the government officials, uh, be it the nonprofits, uh, because a, yes, there is lack of funding. We should all accept it. But we also have not given them enough space to experiment. They are the best people to kind of know what's happening in the ground, right? They listen to the communities like nobody else. And therefore, we have to give them space to create models, to create data. Everybody says, oh, there is no data in this system. There's no data because nobody is talking about it. Nobody's funding. Uh, and ultimately, everybody needs money to do these kind of things. And I think the other thing that at least we've been a bit conscious about as we have chosen our ground partners is we realize that land cannot be a vertical when somebody is providing some service. Because it's like a third or the fourth degree of work that you end up doing with the community. You have to build the trust, you have to build the collectives. So we as funders have to stop looking at it as a program which will deliver to so many women. It is something that you, it's in your best interest to build on an existing structure of community 
etc so that it can be added as a layer and i think if you are patient the results will come and i don't think it's a decade long conversation maybe it's a 5 to 7 year long conversation uh, of course pluses and minuses because there are at least our view is there are low hanging fruits as well so look at forest rights act right one would hope that you could do things in 5 years but if you look at inheritance which is very very complex then obviously you'll have to give more more leeway i would think but coming back to your question we have looked at partners so partner selection will be very very important or has been very important and shreya you've been part of it so you know we've uh, worked with uh, we've chosen partners who have a history of working with government along with them at the same time trying to push the envelope so it's not about taking status quo but it's about saying okay let's get this done but also should what should be the um and future you know changes to the policy but in a more uh, conciliatory i know it's not the right word but more a uh, you know let's work on it together approach rather than a more confrontational approach i would say so i think that's um, that's sense. our view of politics of it makes sense makes sense thank you so much um shikha i'm going to ask you one more uh, you know difficult question that i used to find very hard to answer so i you know put you on the spot to try and answer it um many people say that slum dwellers are squatters they illegally occupied the land so why should they be given any sort of titles to it so how would you respond to that and in the, in especially in the context of women in these slums right uh, if you start treating them as illegal squatters uh, you know what what's the implication um share a difficult question um and um, unfortunately a very pervasive view across our country um and especially um, you know among a lot of the uh, better off residents of cities uh, but in all the work that we've done that uh, across the country you know most residents of slums unfortunately continue to be called squatters despite the fact that they've been there for at least two generations we work with coastal uh, communities in orissa or we work with uh, generations of migrants in surat um and you know um, these are women who say that my mother in law came to work from bihar to surat and we've lived in this slum uh you know when she came we had this part of the hut we've just moved it uh, you know expanded a bit here they still for two generations of women in that city who worked in the city and lived there all their lives um have been denied all basic services have been denied on entitlements um they are not eligible for quite a few of the state government schemes because they don't have those requisite papers so a very very unfortunate situation one that i don't agree with um and i think I, that is something that adds to the vulnerability of the of women living in slums the fact that most uh, women who are living in slums are women who've migrated or whose families have migrated from rural areas and most migration is linked to land it's a fact that you know the families are landless they have small land holdings the income from land is not enough they move to cities um they don't have a place to stay they are uh, you know they are forced to find a place in slums there is an informal market that uh, land market existing in the slums so they are obviously paying some local um for want of a better word i would say henchman in india we say dada or uh, somebody like that who gives them a you know a, a small um, tenement on rent or you know there's some informal transfers those are happening uh, and they live with that insecurity of tenure all their lives and let's face it evictions affect women disproportionately the lack of basic services affect women more it's when you know most of these women who are living in slums are home based workers they are working in the informal economy uh you know and last year when we had the whole uh, crisis when we saw we had the lockdown and we saw migrants walking back um we realized the, the the numbers that were working in the informal economy the fact that our cities have no records of these people living there and most 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 women who are living in these slums are doing home based work whether they making badi papad they're working in doing some stitching work 
all of them and for them their livelihood is within these four walls these four walls which are so insecure they have you know they don't know when where they will be evicted so definitely a uh, more vulnerability of women living in slums um the fact that you know um, like i mentioned before the fact that they are living there they have no basic rights they are not uh, you know most of the state government housing schemes they're not eligible for they're not they don't have access to uh, finance like uh, you know the credit because they don't have um, collaterals or they don't have an address proof um, so uh, it's 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 a very precarious existence if i may say that and of course the uh, the uh, the social norms like what shivani uh, mentioned uh, those continue to persist in the urban areas they may just you know they, it's not that they moved out uh, of uh, the rural setup where there's much more stronger caste links and they moved to urban areas these social norms continue to exist they are sometimes strengthened in very different ways um they uh, they continue to live uh, you know and that sense of community that sometimes exists or most times exists in rural areas where they're living here they're uprooted coming to an urban area where that sense of community is not there but the social cultural norms the patriarchy that they have you know that they faced in the rural area continues to persist yeah right uh, very insightful and actually is uh, you know at times these listening to these can make it make the problem look really daunting so tim given your global experience can you share a few success uh, stories with us you know where has you know folks who navigated some of these challenges in other parts of the world and uh, do you think we can replicate it in india um well well there has been progress already in india we've talked about some of it there's there's been progress in other countries too i think india um india can learn from progress made in other places but one has to be careful about that in terms of replicating i i think because um gender relations are very contextual property rights are certainly very contextual um was and i know you weren't suggesting this treya but one has to be very careful about not thinking about india importing like a success from another country but um but having said that i do think where we've seen progress in in women's land rights and other places that that people in india who understand that context within india can draw lessons from progress in other places and adapt it to india and that progress can come i mean i point to progress certainly in the legal and the policy front on the implementation front on the training of government officials on sensitization of um and awareness raising for women of their own rights but also of men and you'll you'll hear me emphasize men again and again because it's not i mean it is important when uh you make progress in term in the law and policy in terms of um strengthening rights of women on paper of course it's very important that women understand that they have these rights and how to exercise them but it's also ultimately at the end of the day men are still holding so much of the land and so much of the power and so much of the policy making power and until we um really start changing the mindsets and minds and awareness of men um i'm i'm afraid our how much progress we'll be able to make will be limited so but you asked about progress in other places in the world um yeah i maybe during the 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 question and answers i can get into the specifics um but i i'm a bit reluctant to point to specifics because of my caution about importing successes from other places it's not just that easy uh unfortunately i think there's principles to be learned in like how progress was made and then you apply them to the to the local situation of course within india as all of you know much better than i do um india itself is not anywhere near 
<laughs> um, homogenous. Um, every state is different and within each state, every district is different within each district, you know, rural and urban is different. So, um, and I don't wanna make it sound more complex than it is because progress can be made and is being made and will continue to be made. And uh, people standing on the right side of history, I think will look back and say, these countries, these states in India, these places made progress on women's land rights and women and children and men and the societies are healthier and better uh, because of it. And why didn't we do this sooner? Um, but it, it takes, uh, it's not just one thing. It takes a lot um, of change and we all have roles to do, as I said, not only at an individual level, um, but um, at the family level, at the, at the um, community level with, with NGOs and, and at the government level. Uh, and by the way, just, just I just wanna um, underline something that Shivani said earlier about the way we um, um, try to advance land rights for within civil society in particular. I, I think thinking of land not just as a, as a vertical or as a sector is, is a better way. It's, a, it's better to think of applying a land rights lens to other activities. So I, I often say if you are, if your issue is agricultural productivity, if your issue is peace and conflict, if your issue is environmental protection, if your issue is um, furthering entrepreneurialism, access to finance, whatever it might be, if you put a land rights lens and a women's land rights lens onto that activity and that issue and that topic, you can further accelerate your objectives <laughs> and at the same time move move things forward on women's land rights, but it doesn't have to be done by, by itself. So i um, not sure I answered your, your question well in terms of examples from the outside, but um, I would encourage those in India who, are, who want to be advancing women's land rights in India to, to go outside and try to learn from experience outside that's, that's more important than having experts come from outside of India into India. Because if they don't understand the context of India, they might, um, they might not apply the, the, the successes from another country appropriately in India. Makes sense, Tim, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm going to move on from, I think, Tim, you touched upon, there is a, you know, it's not all doom and gloom and it's possible and there is success. It needs to be, um, you know, for in the context of India and India itself is multiple, multiple, you know, uh, dimensions and variations across our states. Um, so what's the opportunity out there, right? Like Shivani, if, if I were to say you're a new funder in this space, you've studied this, this, you know, what are the opportunities that excite you the most? You know, what kind of solutions are you looking for as an entrepreneur? What would what should an entrepreneur, you know, um, think about? If is, do you have an advice for someone like an entrepreneur who's looking to enter this field? I think I'm too new in this space to give an uh, uh, an answer to the ent uh, entrepreneur, but I can share for sure what is what is the kind of solutions which we are looking for as we work with our partners. Is uh, I think there are couple of very important players in this ecosystem, the women rights organization or women centric organizations and the land centric organization. And in a utopian stage, you would want all women rights organizations to talk about land and all land rights organizations to give gender an equal stake. So our perspective is that we need to get these two currently siloed type of CSOs together. Uh, and maybe that's uh, internal learning, the you know the Indian version of import and export that Tim kind of mentioned in our in the previous um, response, uh, and from a solutions perspective, there is lots and lots of scope. Whether it's use of technology, uh, just around data and research, there is so much which can be done. A lot of it can be automated, or, or it can be lighter research rather than very heavy duty 
two year old long research projects, which are always welcome, but as we know, um, can be quite challenging. Um, and I think what will be interesting to also see apart from the models would be what happens to land post acquisition? What do women do? How does that? So what is the real impact? Because the studies that we refer to are very localized. They are, uh, you know, with a deeper intervention uh, and a lot of hand holding. So what is, so it's probably a long-term view of what happens to land. I think uh, if I was to give like a couple of quick pointers to funders and, and people wanting to enter. For funders, you get into it uh, from a horizontal perspective because that's the long-term play. Have a long-term perspective. Uh, and you try to work with diverse set of people who are looking at land as a solution rather than an issue. So I, if you kind of take that perspective and, and land is a very wide con, uh, canvas, so, so start, uh, be clear, maybe start small and then grow. I don't know what's the right strategy, it depends on the fund. So for ours, we have picked a couple of causes and we said in phase one, we are going to do this because we are new, money is limited, experience is limited, blah, blah, blah. I think from an entrepreneur perspective, uh, like we said, there are lots of opportunity, but don't look at setting up new monolith organizations work with others because there is a lot of work which has been done in this space it's been patchy but maybe there's need for solutions and providers who can stitch it together to form a a, a larger canvas and and trust the partners that you work with because they're your own ground partners are your assets in this whole whole ecosystem i think everybody else will come and go they are the ones who will kind of hang around with you so that's my two cents worth very wise words, Shivani. But tell me more about the areas that you've picked for phase one of so your effort. So phase one has been primarily uh, working with um, three organizations who come from a women's rights perspective and therefore inheritance is quite integral to the service they offer to their communities. And a couple of, so and one, the other piece has been the uh, government allocated land or forest rights. So we picked a couple of organizations who work on forest rights, uh, because as you know, that provides for joint titling and um, in our heads and maybe wrongly, it's an easier pick. Not that it is easy, it's easier than inheritance. Um, and uh, there are a lot of cases, as you know, uh, Shreya, of where the government has actually allocated land as compensation in for different things like in MP for Bhopal tragedy, et cetera, where the land has not come to the right person or to the right women. So we are also picked up a couple of organizations who are working on that. But none of them work on women land rights in its purest avatar today, and we don't want them to. We don't want them to work on the purest avatar ever. We want them to integrate seamlessly into their existing program with the hope that in five to seven years, you know, these organizations look at land rights as one of the services across all their programs. And if that can happen, I think that's success for us um, in the long, in five to seven years. Super. Very helpful to get that perspective, Shivani. So essentially you're saying, um, on one hand, let's tap into existing, uh, the law, the enabling laws are there, right? We have a legal framework, which is by and large, very gender equitable. How do you enable that to translate into action on the ground and really, you know, empower people with the law? Essentially, yeah. there's no need to, you know, fight the system. You actually need to make the system work for you. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, Shikha, on, from the urban perspective, what do you see as, you know, uh, the next frontier, what are the opportunities for uh, women's land rights in the urban space? And therefore, if you had to, you know, share some uh, advice with um, other philanthropies in India, uh, you know, encourage them to enter into this space, what would you say to them? Yeah, Shreya, um, I would say that land rights is only a stepping stone. Um, it's like, you know, what Tim and Shivani have mentioned before me and what we've also seen from our work. Um, it, it has to be um, accompanied by making women aware of their rights, empowering them to exercise those rights, 
And this I talk uh, specifically in the context of women uh, living in informal settlements in urban uh, in urban areas. Um, there are uh, there are existing laws that some of them could come in under the ambit of, but where there are no existing legal uh, frameworks, um, I would uh, you know I would recommend I would and this is a, a very uh, big part and has been a big part of the advocacy work that we've been doing for other state governments across the country to replicate or to adapt to or contextualize the Orissa law for uh, you know for uh, for um, other parts other similar informal settlements across the country but uh, I would emphasize again what is very very essential is for women even in Orissa or in other parts of the country, to be aware of what exactly land rights, this, 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 uh, you know, this um, kind of um, this power, this uh, enabling, uh, you know, what what it can enable for them to empower them to exercise that right to understand what it, it what it can do for them, for it to actually transform. Uh, relations within the family, uh, you know, enable them to take decisions both within, outside the family to, you know, be more strongly involved in livelihood activities. So yes, I would say first step land rights move. And um, like Shivani said, it, it has, to, it is in horizontal. It's not something that you move into land rights and then you step out saying, okay, we've given so many women land rights and that's done. It, it is, uh, you know, I remember when um, uh, we used, a lot of the time when we had these development discourses and they are, you know, we just talk about education. They say when you educate a woman, you educate a family and things like that. So it's something similar. You're giving a, a you know, a woman, you're empowering a woman, you're empowering the family, you're empowering in the community. You're also uh, leading up to a improvement, not just in the woman's life, but also in the improvement in the life of the household. Uh, and um, you know, um, and of the community. So uh, please look at, and that has been, and I will again quote from the work that we've done in Orissa. The law was very clear, and we, uh, you know, we worked with the government uh, to have uh, some what was called the Jaga Mission, which said basically six cornerstones of the Jaga Mission that beyond land rights, we are moving to uh, basic services: uh, water, sanitation, waste management, light, energy. Uh, livelihoods, all of it ensured to all slum communities from 65,000 beneficiaries that we mentioned of, la la of land rights, which uh, are women, of course, as joint holders. There are 25,000 which have translated into building pakka houses now. There are about, uh, you know, um, slums in uh, around 500 slums across these urban local bodies, which have been no denotified because they've got access to a lot of the basic services that would move, uh, entitle them to move up. So uh, I would say that is uh, kind of the next frontier to look at it as an entry point, as a stepping stone, you're empowering women, and then you're moving on to the next stage. So um, that, of course, and then um, if I have to talk in, um, you know, if I have to uh, say for, at the policy level, um, I think uh, land rights, uh, what has happened till now in the urban space, um, you know, while you're giving land rights, also we'll have to look at credit mechanisms that specifically focus on needs of women uh, especially women groups within the settlements, uh, you know, they have easy access to these credit, they have a freedom to rent, sell land, all of that has to come in. And then, of course, um, again, um, an example from Orissa, which is very good, is the fact that while these communities have worked on some slum upgrade, upgradation, there's been a very strong involvement of women. So the women, uh, because they're so uh, such a, uh, you know, they are the major component of the Slum Dwellers Association, they have a strong say in it. In quite a few of the slums, it's the women who are deciding where the open spaces have to be. There is there is an open space called Pariche. That's where they meet and they sit. Their livelihood activity is being done there. It's maintained by the Slum Dwellers Association. They decide where the public toilet is going to be. They decide uh, how the drains or the waste collection has to be done. So all of it, I think the whole urban governance bit has to overlay on this, on the land rights. And it has to be very, very, um, you know, strongly pro-women. So. Uh, we may have gender neutral laws and policies and programs, but we have to move from there to a more pro-women, a more, uh, uh, you know, women stronger involvement in both the design as well as the implementation and execution of these programs. So while I have to talk, and this I would say would uh, apply for philanthropies uh, uh, like us and others out there that, you know, you make the woman the center of your program while you're designing a program, while you're implementing and while you're executing. I couldn't agree more. And um, 
you know, it is amazing to see how in the Jaga mission, when the, the households have got the titles and that just unlocked the access to, you know, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana and so many people getting, you know, pakka houses. I mean, it's just transformation across generations that's possible. Um, thanks for sharing that, Shikha. Uh, Tim, maybe if I had to ask you, um, you know, from your vantage point, if you had to say, what do local governments, uh, what should state governments in India, you know, think about how can, what is the role that they can play in encouraging the, you know, uh, better women's land rights. But, you know, as we've, as we're saying, there are a lot of great laws. It's the implementation that needs to improve on the ground. So what role can they play? And how, you know, how can funders also, you know, participate in this journey? What, you know, what can you say to encourage more funders to support um, this journey? Yeah, um, great questions, Freya. And uh, before I answer that, I just want to like say a plus one to both what Shivani and Shiga have said about um, and the answers to your previous questions. I thought those were great answers. Um, ultimately, the you know you ask about the role of state and local governments. In terms of government role, actually state and local governments have bigger roles to play, I think, in this issue than, than does the central government. Um, you know, land is primarily a state subject in India in your federal system. Um, um, so there certainly is that role for the, for the state government in terms of all kinds of um, issues around land, recording land rights. Um, mapping, it, you know, uh, survey settlement. Um, I, I also think the local governments, actually, I, I, my own view is that India has underused um, or not empowered um, local governments enough. Um, and local governments, um, particularly their role over land. If you look just broadly, again, um, across the world. I think you'll find in many high income and middle high income countries, a much more active role that local governments are playing as it relates to land use, land control, um, generating tax revenue from land. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, Panchayat, the Panchayat structure in India is has so much potential here and hasn't been hasn't been given its rightful place uh, in in land. I I'm frankly not sure exactly what um, how found foundations can help support that, but I do think it needs uh, like research and attention to empower local governments in their kind of uh, control and decision making. Overland and including advancing uh, women's land rights. Um, I, I think there is a lot of roles for funders to play. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I just, there's a smile on my face when I hear Shivani talking about what they're doing because um, I, and Trey, as you know, you were a, a very um, a lonesome funder maybe for a while on this issue in, in India. Um, there's so much that. Um, civil society can do, particularly in the con kind of the constructive engagement with government and helping government build up their, their capacity and capabilities, help to train government officials at the, at the panchayat level, at the state level. Um, I think there's a great, great need for that. And that, that's a role where, where philanthropic um, capital can come in and, and help. Um, I think that the, yeah, incorporating a land rights lens into all other types of programs, both government schemes and, um, um, and, and, uh, and NGO programs. I think there's just so much, I know I'm talking very much in generalities here, but it is, this issue is so crucial. If I could just jump again up to kind of the very high level, if you think about India as a great country, and of course it is a great country and it's starting to take its rightful place on the global stage. Um, but 
on issues of gender, it's so lagging, you know, on, on and, and of course, th this is more than just about women's land rights, but, but in, a, in a country where, as Pranav mentioned, I think at the very beginning, something like 75% of household wealth is, co is comprised in, in um, land and real property, then if you have a big gender gap there, uh, it's going to contribute to gender gap, not just in wealth and income, but in status and power and decision making, and so, in so many other places. It's, it's it's a trickle down. So it's not just one little piece of it. And and India, I think, in the last World Economic Forum gender gap report of the 156 countries, India placed 140th. I mean, that's that's and 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 it's going down. It's getting worse. Um, so I, I just really believe even more broadly that until India really can tackle this gender gap, by the way, you know, innovation, creativity, smarts, um, ability to change the world is evenly distributed amongst men and women. Uh, and so you're essentially, we're, we're losing out on this un, underused potential of women. <laughs> When, when they don't have equal rights to, to land and, and finance and political power and so many other things. But because land is, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is, it's not just about housing. It is about housing. It's not just a, a, a livelihoods, it's wealth, power, status, political power, household decision-making, community, community decision-making. It is this kind of a cross thematic thing that if you want to help address that gender gap in India, which I think is a big stumbling block for India as it, as it ascends on the world stage, then if you, you're not addressing the women's rights to land, you're, you're missing a big part of it. Very, very well put, uh, Tim, and, and thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a sobering thought, but yes, I think you know, it's, you're encouraging us um, to, to aspire more and aspire higher. Um, we're almost nearing the end of our uh, conversation, but there's one comment that we got from the audience, Tim, was addressed to you, and I, you know, you could consider um, you know, your thoughts to, to respond around it, but essentially says that the norms around social issues like uh, women's land rights are very sticky, um, usually a social and ecological approach, which looks at individual, family, and society is needed, um, and there's an organization called Breakthrough. Um, which has adopted this approach successfully, so there could be potentially learnings for women's land rights. Um, any quick reactions from you, Tim, or anyone else as well? I think you know folks who are familiar with Breakthrough could also chime in. Well, Breakthrough is a group, Breakthrough is a great organization. So um, I, 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 I'm and I, I'm an admirer of their work, and uh, I I do think these norms, these gender norms. Uh, around land rights are are super important. I mean, why? I I remember way back in I was living in India. I think it was breakthrough that led the, the campaign about the the ring the bell. Bell yeah, yeah, about uh, that about domestic violence. So, you know, maybe something like that can be done about um, about women's land rights. Like, why why aren't parents in India I don't know, taking pledges about giving their land equally to their sons and their daughters, giving land to their daughter-in-laws. I mean, th these are the types of things that it'll take, you know, one, one family at a time um, about changing these norms. And I, one observation I had made, not just in India, but working in other places of the world in terms of changing men's minds on this, that um, it seems easier to change men's mind about uh, about land rights for females if you talk to them about their daughters rather than talking to them about their their wives. I don't know what what it is about men somehow, but it but appealing to to men about their about their daughters as some way to. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not a social behavioral change kind of specialist and a communication specialist, but I am sure that breakthrough with their creative minds and together maybe with some 
some of the land rights groups that that Shivani is funding could could come up with some type of campaign that would that would start challenging these these gender norms and these ways of thinking that are just so so deep we don't even question them sometimes right yeah. they're just so ingrained it's like if we can just cause people to ask the question well why aren't we giving land to our daughter-in-laws or to our daughters um at least they get them thinking anyway so I, i'm I'm sure I'm not the right person to provide the answer, but that is part of the solution is through changing these, these norms. So true, so true. Um, yeah, I, yeah, can I just yeah, add? Yeah, I think, absolutely, uh, Shivani. What Jim said is absolutely right, right? Right. There is the policy piece, there is the implementation piece, but narrative change is such a uh, underlying requirement uh, that, that you know, and those are not going to come from government. It has to come from private philanthropy uh, or philanthropic money primarily. And that's where I think funders live. And, and it is a, it's a difficult space to be in as a funder because, you know, it's not tangible. It's not like I've reached out to so many women or whatever. So I think it'll be interesting to see if we can kind of get a few people together to run a, this because it is an important pillar. But we found it to be very challenging from a acceptability within the community, funder community perspective. Actually, we have a lot of good partners. There is Breakthrough, I know of a couple of others who can do amazing job, both in rural India and in urban India, but it's about getting it all lined up uh, together to make it happen. So yeah, it's a very, very important element. Yeah. And, and there's like Sorry, just to jump in, there's likely a very important role for um, for pop culture, you know, leaders to play in in changing that narrative. I mean, I've seen in other countries, you would know better about, about India, but I can imagine, you know, through Bollywood, through cricketers, through other celebrities kind of um, using the power of, of media and celebrity and film and um, to, to, change, to change attitudes. Um, yeah, and, and Breakthrough is, I'm glad they were mentioned because they're, they, I'm sure, I hope they do take this up. <laughs> I hope so too. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Um, you know, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us, uh, Tim, especially at your from Seattle, uh, but also Shivani, Shekha. This has been a wonderful conversation. Great. And uh, thank you to the Sankalp team as well uh, for giving us the opportunity. Uh, I think this is the first time Sankalp has picked up this particular topic. I think it, it, it you know, really sh is great for the field and uh, you know, hope to see a lot more funders and entrepreneurs jumping in to solve this problem. It is a wicked problem, uh, all of us agree, and therefore, you know, worth getting all the bright minds uh, to work at it. So thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Pranav. Thanks, Shreya. I think it was a wonderful conversation uh, and I was trying to capture something and tweet. So I was just, you know, as you're trying to tweet something, something else was coming up. It was too, too, too tough to miss uh, anything. I think overall it was a great conversation and I think we are uh, uh, no, no, lots of time now in this session where we have to now hand over to uh, organizers for an award ceremony. But I think we'll be coming back with those who have registered for the uh, impact conversation. We'll be taking this conversation forward. As you know, this is an important issue and Sankalp has given a space to it. And let us see how funders and entrepreneurs, as they said, can come together to you know, address this uh, daunting challenge and overcome patriarchy to you know, uh, enhance in a land right. Thank you all. Over to the organizers, George and Ugosi, to take it forward. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Margaret Nakunza. I'm coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya. 
I will be your host for the Sankap Global Awards 2021, where we will continue to celebrate entrepreneurs and their role in impacting millions around the world. We will be honoring the five most promising social enterprises across sectors. On behalf of the Avishka Group, Intelecup, and Sankalp, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the 13th edition of the Sankalp Global Awards 2021. The Sankalp Awards are one of the Global South's most prestigious social enterprise awards. Over the years, Sankalp has recognized more than 2,400 social enterprises and channeled more than $270 million to high-impact businesses. The awards are designed to support young companies and recognize their impact, which is successfully steering change. This year, we had an overwhelming number of entries with over 250 applications from 52 countries globally. Each enterprise went through three rounds of assessment, and finally, 10 of the best enterprises pitched to a esteemed grand jury from Asia, America, and Africa. I'd like to introduce today's sector, health, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Between the years 2000 to 2016, significant progress towards several health-related SDGs have increased. For instance, the average life expectancy globally has increased from 66 years to 72 years. However, at least half the world's population still lacks access to essential health services and almost 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty each year because of out-of-pocket health expenses. Contaminated water and poor sanitation are linked to transmission of diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, dysentery, hepatitis A, typhoid, and polio. Absent inadequate or inappropriately managed water and sanitation services expose individuals to preventable health risks. In 2017, 5.3 billion people used safely managed drinking water services. That is, they used improved water sources located on premises, available when needed, and free from contamination. The remaining 2.2 billion people without safely managed water services rely on unprotected wells and springs, untreated surface water from lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams, and often require travel times of more than half an hour to collect water. An aspect of water, sanitation, and hygiene that is often overlooked is access to menstrual hygiene products which is a major concern facing women in developing countries. Lack of access to menstrual hygiene products often means that women face considerable difficulties going about their lives during menstruation. They may be entirely restricted to their homes due to practical reasons as well as stigma frequently associated with menstruation. Women frequently resort to using whatever materials they have at home to replace sanitary pads. This can be rags, pieces of mattress, cotton wool, cowhide, or other unclean materials which can result in infections. Inclusive business models are offering access to healthy, hygienic lives. We would like to feature two such enterprises today. Our first nominee is Beagle from the United States and Mozambique.
Our second nominee is Folia Water from Bangladesh. For Sankov Global Awards 2021 for Health and Wash is, drum roll please, Folia Water from Bangladesh. We will now have a word from the winner. Hello everyone, this is Mahmoud Rashid. I am the CEO of Folia Water. Thank you so much to the Shankal Global Award team and also the Shankal Jury Selection team to selecting Folia Water as the winner of Shankal Global Award 2021. We would like to send our deepest uh, gratitude to our team, our investors and the stakeholders who put in, in us the, uh, their time and their money in the company. And also we would like to send our gratitude to our partners, our customers around the world. Please visit our virtual booth and we can connect and work together in future to solve the universal access of safe drinking water. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into the Sunk of Global Awards 2021. Please join me in congratulating the winner and all of Sunk of Awards finalists. You can visit the enterprises in the virtual exhibition space to learn more about them. If you're interested in investing in any of these amazing companies, please feel free to reach out to me via the virtual platform. I hope you enjoy the remainder of the summit. My name is Alice Goodbrook and I'm from Innovate UK, which is the home of Energy Catalyst, and I'm based in London. At Energy Catalyst, we accelerate the innovation needed to end energy poverty and improve lives across Africa and Asia. We're really excited to be at Sankalp because the entrepreneurs we support need access to markets, partners and investors. There's no better place than Sankalp for them to get all of that in one place. We hope our entrepreneurs will learn, network and maybe even find an investor at Sankalp. We hope you have a great sun cow and please reach out to the Energy Catalyst team if you're also working towards ending energy poverty. Mm -hmm.